Thank you for the special music. You know, when music is presented from people whose character matches the words, it just means so much. You know, we, we've known Paul and Bonnie and Sharon and everybody who does music so long. And I say that because, I hate to tell you, we're all old. <laughs> But it's nice to have grown old with all of you. To know the, the way in which you've lived your lives, the way in which you've all spread your faith, the way in which you've cared for each other. This is the legacy. It's the power of what God does in our lives. And I, I find it deeply moving. Today, I would like to talk about a topic that I think is equally as moving. My question today is, do you find, find God adequate or do you find God sufficient? Do you find your relationship with God to be adequate or do you find it sufficient? You know, I came upon a website that was very interesting. It's called differencebetween.com. I don't know who created this. You know, there's a lot of creative people out here. They find these topics and they create these things. Differences between. They make this comment about the difference between adequate and sufficient. There are many pairs of words in the English language, they say, that have very similar meanings. If you have something in quantities that are enough to serve that purpose, there are two words people use. They either use sufficient or adequate. They are most commonly used. They are not equal. Adequate and sufficient are not equal. The definition, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary of Adequate says it is an adjective describing condition of something meeting the minimum requirement, but just barely. Thus, if you are told that there is sugar in the kitchen and an adequate amount to meet the requirements for the family for the coming week, you can assume that next week, on day seven, you need to go shopping for sugar. Sufficient, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary says, is a word that describes a condition. A condition meaning as much as is needed. If something or someone is sufficient for a purpose, you can relax. You can take a breath because sufficient means there will be a competent, a appropriate amount. We could say, if you're talking about the kitchen again, that having received a reply that we have sufficient sugar to make six pies, we know that you can burn a few and you still have plenty of sugar in the kitchen. You have sufficient sugar for the, to create those pies. There's a verse in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, chapter nine and verse eight, which uses this concept of sufficiency. And I think there's a great lesson here. It's one that I did not actually understand. And I found it extremely encouraging. Let us read this scripture together. In 2 Corinthians chapter nine, let us start in verse six. It says, but this I say to you, the apostle Paul says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. There's the words, abounding, all, always, sufficiency, all things. We need to explore this verse today. I submit that you and I need to understand this verse so that we can judge God as sufficiently giving us forgiveness, sufficiently giving us his spirit, sufficiently giving us a connectedness that is plentiful enough to do all that is before us, lest we become discouraged 
lest we become weary thinking that we just don't have an adequate amount. We have sufficiency, Paul says, to do all things. I would invite us to explore this topic today because I think it will change your mindset as it has mine. We need to first look at the background of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, chapter 8, what Paul was talking about. We need to understand the physical lesson that he was making. And if we understand the physical lesson that Paul was making, we then get to understand the spiritual lesson, the greater spiritual lesson that he ends with in verse 8, to understand all grace abounding and having all sufficiency in our lives. The wider intellectual point that we need to come away with from this verse is that emotional and spiritual opportunity for sufficiency is represented by the fountain of God, the basin of reception that we are from it, and the stream which must flow from our lives and thus from God to those around us. So let's first talk about the background. Before I talk about background, I wanted to welcome home Blanca. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that earlier. Aren't we all thrilled that Blanca's home? I mean, folks, I mean, my heart just goes, I mean, if, if, you know, it's one thing to travel, and I know she was in her home, you know, where her parents and, every, and her father is and everything. But if you, when you get sick and you're not home, you're sick. And then when you get sick and you have to go into the hospital, you're even further from home. And then when you have an operation, you're even further. And here's Bla Lauren up here. Her children are here. I mean, I don't know. And so our, our heart was with you. Our, our prayers were with you. So we're thrilled you're home. So, and so now, you know, as we go back and talking about the background of, of chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, what was happening is Paul was taking up a collection to take to the brethren in need in Judea. And we see this back in chapter 8, and we see it all the way through chapter 8. But specifically, you can read a few verses at the beginning, where it verses, chapter 8, verse 16. But thanks be to God who puts the, uh, the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. And then he proceeds through verses 24 to talk about this offering that they're going to take up and take to the people. Notice what he said. Then even over the page in, verses, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, he says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness about which I boast to you, to the Macedonians, that Caia was ready to a year ago, and your zeal has been stirred up by the majority. Paul is talking about this physical offering that they were going to take up. A reference, Romans chapter 15, verse 26, Paul, in writing to the Romans, talks about this very offering that was taken up and was brought to, to be brought to Judea. You know, there's a, in setting the stage for understanding this background, Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges made a comment that says, it was really not necessary to remind them of the matter of the Christian prudence that must not allow themselves to be taken unawares, lest the amount of their bounty should hardly correspond to what men had a reason to expect. They had a reason, Judea had a reason to know that an offering was coming, and it was going to be enough. It was going to be sufficient. It was not going to be adequate. Okay? And so that's the physical place we find ourselves in. Now, oh, I wanted to mention a sidebar as we think about this. We have two offerings coming up on Love and Bread, right? An opportunity now to think about those offerings, to think about the blessings we've been having, to plan for those offerings. I mean, I know a, a number of people... Uh, plan for offerings. They put so much aside every week so that they have plenty. So you're not taking out of the grocery money to plan an offering, right? So the, there's a, there, uh, this is stewardship and these are nice things to be reminded. And I think we see that here. But there's something else in this background that we must understand was going on. And Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges goes on to make this comment that Paul is acutely aware of the philosophy of the time of Aristotle in talking about this concept of sufficiency. You see, as Ellicott's commentary 
makes the comment about this very understanding of what was in the Greek thought, which was pervasive in the world around him. And this is Paul's writing to the, these very people. It says, to be independent, self-sufficing, was with them the crown of a perfect life. Aristotle vindicates that quality for happiness as he defines it, as is consisting of the activity of the intellect and thus distinguishing from wealth and pleasure and other accidents of which men might constantly mistook themselves for. At this time when Paul wrote, it was constantly on the lips of the Stoics how they could be sufficient in thought and not worry about the physical. This is where their thoughts were, and this is why Paul takes them from a physical offering discussion in chapter 8 and 9 and brings us down to this very spiritual concept of self-sufficiency in verse 9. Now, another sidebar. I thought, hmm, I've never looked up an Aristotle document. Can I, can I find one? Guess what? There's a thing called pdfdrive.com. On pdfdrive.com, you can find probably thousands of free documents that are in the public domain. And, of course, Aristotle's works are in the public domain. <laughs> but the translators who may translate them, of course, may be different. But anyway, I found one that was free, and it was Aristotle, Nicomanian Ethics. It was translated by W.D. Ross, published by Batch Books in Kitchener in 1999. And sure enough, on page 175, we find the reference that the biblical scholars reference that Paul was talking about. And here it says, breaking in, it says, but the individual must, oh, I love, okay, I, I got to read the, the beginning part. He says this, this is what they were thinking at the time. They'd all read and knew these things. If reason is divine, okay, this is, remember, self-sufficiency, being up here only in the head all the time. If reason is divine, then in comparison with man, the life according to it is divine in comparison with human life. But we must not follow those who advise us being men to think of human things and being mortal of mortal things, but must, so far as we can, make ourselves immortal and strain every nerve to live in accordance with the best things in us. This is where they were going. This is why it was on their minds, okay, to be this self-sufficient person and self-sufficient in thinking. He goes on, to say, therefore, the life according to reason is the best life. It's the most pleasantest life. Since reason more than anything else is man, this life, therefore, is also the happiest. Paul is going to take them from Aristotle's limited intellectual discussion into a spiritual discussion. Sufficient to them was the highest of high thoughts. So now, in the first century time, we understand and we can see that the developed Greek logic and discussion of the day, and Paul is fully aware of it. Now let's see where Paul takes us in talking about the physical offering. Let's go back over to chapter 8, verse 24, in our second major point, to understand the physical offering, as we've understood the background, then we get to go and understand the spiritual offering and discussion that he's making. We start back in chapter 8, verse 24, where Paul says, Therefore, show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of your boasting on your behalf. Paul is saying, look, he's aware of Proverbs 11.24, is he not? There is one who scatters, yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty, Proverbs 11.24 says. Or Proverbs 22, verse 9, it says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. Paul knew these concepts out of Scripture. Certainly, Paul has written of the collection both in chapters 8 and again in chapter 9. But in talking about the physical offering, as he begins his words in chapter 9, he takes a delicate but rhetorical turn, Meyer's New Testament commentary says, so that in order to spare the readers their sense of honor, he doesn't leave them only talking about the physical offering that's needed. 
He takes them to the higher spiritual principle to understand sufficiency from a spiritual way. So now, let us go to chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast to the Macedonians. I read this before. You see how he moves. He moves very specifically out of the physical realm, and he says, well, I don't really need to talk to you about this. You know what's needed. Okay, and now he goes and he wants to talk about this intellectual point, about the emotional and spiritual connectedness and understanding that we have a connectedness with God that is more than adequate. It is sufficient. You know, there was a saying at the time, and it comes from Epiricus around 321 B.C., it was involved in Aristotle thinking at the time, that thinking was the highest pursuit. So Paul is laying on, if thinking's the highest pursuit, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to take you there because God is the one who created thought and ideas, right? I can take you to a higher place than you've even thought of go, going before. And this is what he begins to do. So as we talk about this now, let's talk about the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual opportunity for sufficiency. Notice what it says in verse 10 of chapter 9. He says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Paul, once again, he takes a physical principle and now puts it into the spiritual realm. Notice down in verse 13, he says, While through the proof of this ministering, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with those, with them and all men. Liberally sharing what? Not their money. Liberally sharing the gospel message. Liberally sharing that your life is freed from sin. That the power of Jesus Christ changes everything for you. Notice what it says, and, their, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of exceeding grace of God in you. The grace of God shed in you reaps a reward. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. To be independent and self-sufficing was with them, remember I said from Ellicott, the crown of the perfect life. Paul, after his fashion, is lifting up a little secular matter about a, taking up an offering for those in need and lifts it to the highest spiritual place. He takes it to the very depth of the Christian message, McLaren's exposition says. And this is where I want to take us. As we talk about the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual opportunity for sufficiency, we must understand three things. We must understand that God is likened in the Bible to a fountain. A fountain where his love, mercy, forgiveness all come out. And we, in this analogy, are the basin. We can be filled with that goodness that comes from God. And then we must talk about a stream. Because from our lives, things flow. And the way God waters the earth, if you would, is from this fountain through people like us who have a basin. And that basin overflows and becomes a stream. And this is the principle that Paul is bringing out here. So let's talk about the fountain, the base, and the stream. You see, because Paul in this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8 talks about all the grace which God is able to make abound towards you. It is a many, many-sided question because you see from this great source flow many, many things, but they're all sufficient they're more than adequate. Let's look at this. The first one is the fountain. The fountain is a spring. You know, we think of a fountain as a water fountain, right? But in real water sources, fountains are like these natural springs that come up. We can think of this up in the Central Valley, right? Have you ever been by the fields up through the San Joaquin Valley? And when they turn the water on, it goes through those high 
tiled columns that are, you know, maybe six, seven, ten feet tall because the water comes up there and it, it gets its pressure and then comes back down and flows to the fields. A water, a fountain. Paul is, is bringing out this point as we talk about this fountain that God is able. God is more than able. Notice how he says it in verse 8. God is able to make all grace. It doesn't say God will make. It says God is able. He puts the full weight of this responsibility of receiving of the fountain of life back on us. He says that we must desire it. As we heard in the song today, we must expect it. We must have offer petitions for it. And we, thus receiving it, have a faithful stewardship of it. Remember in Exodus 17, verse 6, the first time they got water and the Israelites out of the rock? The water came forth. And they had to what? They had to go take their pitchers to the fountain of water and get water. They had to go to the fountain. They had to go to the source. May I remind us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, what it says. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. John records the similar comment. John chapter 15, verse 7 says, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. We get to go and petition God. We get to expect he will answer. We get to desire that answer. And having received blessings from God, we then have a faithful stewardship with those blessings. I found a phrase that said, Christian possibilities are Christian obligations. And what we might have and do not have always lies before us. Is there adequate spirits of God in you or sufficient amounts of God's spirit to do all that is before you? You know, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you, and I will make my words known to you. Is it any wonder in the New Testament time, the New Testament period, when they were talking about Christ having been taken up, and on the day of Pentecost, they're talking about they're all gathered together expecting, and how they likened it, you know, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 where Luke records that they literally went back and they said in the book of Joel, in chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And it shall come to pass after this that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. So when they bring this out in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, how could they not think of this? When the Spirit of God had come to them and they had watched people, dozens and dozens and thousands, right, understand and grasp that Jesus Christ had been the life, the truth, and the way, that he was the Messiah, that their lives could be changed, that their sins were forgiven, that baptism was possible, that this was the path to knowing God. This was the revelation, the fulfillment of Joel. And as we look at this, as we look at our changed lives, as we look at our emotional, spiritual intellect and understand that lest God had opened the way and we had seen the fountain and drunk from it, we would be blind too. This is life-giving water. Do we feel and we describing that richness in our life? Do we think it's adequate? Or do we think it's sufficient? That you see it's more than enough to do what needs to be done? Or do we live every day thinking, I just don't muster up God. I just got, I got to have enough spirit to get through the day. And I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just saying sometimes you're at that wit's end. I'm saying sometimes you're like, I, I've got to, and I pause to say, that Paul's point in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, is to say all sufficiency has been given to you. Because God, who is this fountain, is limitless. The water will not dry up. 
Our God is able to make these things. And we just must drink in. There's an old saying, you know, it says, don't be knee deep in the water and forget to put your hand down to drink. If you go back over to 2 Corinthians with me, there's a concept as we talk about this fountain, this bubbling over fountain of God. I mean, it, look, the, there's a, a great new book written by Eric Metaxas, and it's called Is Atheism Dead? And um, I'm listening to the audio version, and I don't like listening to audio versions because then I, I can't remember on what page he said the most magnificent thing. The only problem is every sentence in this book is just fantastic. Okay, so that's the good news. But he, he describes how science, day after day, after the, over the last 70 years, every discovery says that everything we know about life is so fine-tuned. Where we are in the, the whole of, of time, where we are in the whole of matter, where we are cell structures, are we all know that we're just, we, when, we're, when we're functioning exactly right, we're fine-tuned, right? All the cells are replicating, everything's going. And if one thing's out, any of you who are sick will know it doesn't take much to make it not fine-tuned. This is the God who we work, worship. Notice he says in verse 8, chapter 9, he says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Paul is not, look, he could have said, God is able to make all grace towards you, that you should have sufficiency and that things uh, might go well with you. Paul uses every superlative he can muster in this sentence. He says, look, God is able to make all all the grace abound towards you, that you, having always all sufficiency and in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. The Greek word for abound and abundance is the same. It literally means to exceed a fixed number. It means over. It means great. You see, God is able because God is abounding. He's ever-present to make us, to make the universe, to make it all so fine-tuned. He is just overflowing. And it seems to me, when I think about being sufficient, that God is sufficient. He's not adequate. And I come away encouraged. So now, as we talked about the great fountain, let's talk about you and I as a basin before we get to talk about the stream. The second point here is that we are a basin. Our lives are to be, my point is, fully sufficient. Always. That the good gifts of divine grace will always be proportioned to our work and even to our sufferings. Second Corinthians chapter 12, remember over a few pages, Paul had a need and here's how Paul concluded it. And sometimes, you know, we ask. And Paul says, in this case, chapter 12, verse 9, Paul says, and he said, The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than the power that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul was not healed of his infliction. But notice how Paul phrases it. He says, Paul says, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My connectedness through Jesus Christ, my power of forgiveness of sin in your life is the most important thing, Paul said. And then everything else will flow from there. Paul was willing to count God as not adequate in this matter. He was willing to account him as sufficient, offering more than was needed. You know, if we exercise this expectant desire and petitions, faithful stewardship, we shall have what we need. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Notice how Luke records what they felt about the working of the Spirit and how things were going in the first century. Acts 20, verse 32, he says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able, once again, this very concept, the ableness, 
the ability to build you up, to give you an inheritance among all those things that are sanctified. This is where God's taking us. God's taking us to the very fine-tuned spot of eternity out of a fine-tuned physical existence. Wow. McLaren's expositions made a side comment here in talking about the basin. It says, you have had very little experience, either in life or being a Christian, if you have not learned by this time that the harder you work and the darker your sorrows, the mightier have been God's supports. I think we all can reflect on that. The harder we work, the darker our sorrows. As we look back, the mightier have been God's supports. And thus we can claim, as we look on our path, as David said, let thy law be a word, be a light unto my path. And we see that it was God. Proverbs 16, 9. It's in the heart of man to plan his ways. It is the Lord who, what? directs his steps. We can see that God walked us through. What a wonderful thing. Our Christian life, where I want to read Isaiah 41, verse 10, because Isaiah 41, verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God says, my righteous right hand will sustain you. This is the God who is able. Friends, I think that our Christian lives need to run on the high level. That our basin that gets the water from God should be brimming over. You know how it is when you've took a hose and you've got a bird bath and you fill up the little shallowness, right? And all of a sudden, you leave the hose on too long and the water just starts going over and going over. Our lives should be so connected. Our belief in the God being sufficient for us should be so strong, so engaging, that adequate is not in our vocabulary because God is well able to help us. It says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches, in the glory of Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your need. You see, our basin is full because of God's grace. Because of his strong right hand. Our strength comes from the water that gushes from him. The Lord at his command naturally flows to us. If we get under the spigot. If we get in the flow, if we put our hoses in and siphon the water out, whatever, we put our pitcher and go to the stream and pick up the water, however you want to say it, we've got to get there through desire, expectancy, request, and let our lives be full because we judge God sufficient. Now let's talk about the other aspect, and that is the stream that flows from you and I. You see... The meaning here, as Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges says, the meaning here is God is able to make every gift of his loving kindness to abound in you, that you, being thus enriched, may impart his bounty to others. You see, if we just leave ourselves saved, okay, justified with God, and we leave off anything that flows afterwards, what's God doing? It says in Isaiah 55, my spirit does not return to me empty. If it comes to you, there's fruit that bears fruit. Before I read that scripture and talking about that, I found this lovely phrase, and I thought this was cute. It said, evangelical preachers have all too often talked as if the end of all their dealings with mankind was this vague thing called salvation, and by which many of their hearers take them to mean either more or less dodging hell. 
What he's trying to say is, is if the only thing you're in this for is to get saved, is to get right with God, and that you don't expect there to be any overflowingness from our lives, your life, and my life, that doing and living and walking and breathing the right way doesn't do something more. Those of us who have children know this. I mean, you, you, dri you drive love and care and kindness into them. And what happens? And you correct and you nurture and you move and accept. And you watch them bloom and you watch them grow. You watch them fly. Something pr is produced. It grows. It moves forward. And so should our Christian lives be. Because, you see, when we got, judge God sufficient, we understand that the richness of the New Testament message is more than mysticism. We understand that the New Testament message soars, as McLaren says, to its highest and loftiest thoughts because of God, because of his endearing qualities. We never thus lose sight of the wholesome, sane, common morality is that we are not saved alone, that our lives have a flow to others. Philippians, if you'll turn over there with me, Philippians chapter 4. Paul does put it so well here in verses 8 and 9. Finally, my brethren, Philippians 4 verse 8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just. You see how he's talking about the Aristotle thought of self-sufficiency, of the intellect? Well, let's just think about the good things. And Paul says... Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. These things you do because of who you're drinking from, you and I. And the God of peace will be with you. There is a flow that comes. That's why Paul describes it in Galatians. You know, Galatians in chapter 5, it's called the fruit of the Spirit. There's a whole discussion about the singularity of the use of the word. But notice how he says it down in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. This is what the way of God Live, grow, flowing out from us looks like to others. There are days when you need more patience than you have. There are days when you need more love, more compassion, more self-control. And you know why? Where we get it? We get it back from the fountain. It comes to us and it flows out. People say, how were you so patient with that person? And you go, well, I'm connected. But maybe we need to say that. We need to say, I'm a Christian. I get these capacity. I get my sufficiency from a God who is able. I don't get me, or my sufficiency from a God who's adequate. God didn't give me just enough. This has changed my thinking every day. You know what I mean? You know, the phone's jiggling. and juggling. I mean, look, anymore the phone rings, the text rings, the email comes in, and then the second phone rings. I don't know where the second phone comes from sometimes. I don't know. I'm like... Where did they, you know, the iPad starts ringing, the phone's already ringing, and I'm like, how did that happen? I don't know. And do you know what I, and then, and then I hear, Frank, Valerie's got a question from the front room. And I, I need to drop all this and go there. A, wise, a word with the wise young husbands. Okay. But, but where do you get the energy? Where do you get the capacity? Did you ever see the, 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 the Chinese acrobat guy and he's spinning the plates? I never forget when I saw it in 1983 and we brought the uh, stars of the uh, Beijing acrobats to the United States. And we, the guy comes out and he's got four plates and he's got them spinning on those big tall poles, right? He's got the forced four. And you're like, okay, fine, it's cute. You're, and he brings a second table out and he springs another four. But now that first one is starting to get a little slow over there, right? And he's got to run back down there and get, okay? How many tables do you think he brought out? I've seen him do 32 plates at the same time. He, he's running. He's running all the way down there to keep him spinning. Where do we get that energy? Where do we get that love and capacity? It comes back from the fountain of God. This is an incredible thing because when we do that and we go to him, we judge him sufficient to give us what we need that day. Whether it's in the hospital, whether it's on the playground, whether it's in our homes, whether it's with our spouses, 
You know what it says in Hebrews 9.14? My point. Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Our lives equal service. Something flows from them to everybody. James chapter 1 verse 27 says what? Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. We must copy God in his many-sidedness, in his copious amounts of care, patience, and flow of everything we need. We need to judge him fully sufficient, not adequate, because that's what life takes. Life takes a spirit full of sufficiency of God. You know, in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, it's a famous verse, and it says, He who did not... But he who does not know me, you committed these things observing stripes and shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, it says in Luke 12, 48. And, much, and whom much has been committed to him, they will ask the more. You're like, God, can I take, I don't know whether I can take any more. Or do we say, God, you're the fountain. Okay, this person needs me. This situation needs me. This situation needs your capacity, not mine. You see, when we judge God sufficient, it becomes his flow and not ours. And we aren't worried about being adequate. We're worried about turning the valve on big enough to let God flow. Or how about Matthew 23, verse 23, where he talks about, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay the tithe on the mint and the anise and the cumin, and you've, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, of justice, mercy, and faith. I think about that many times during the week, this situation. Am I going to offer judgment here? Justice? Can I extend mercy? How about faith? Each situation requires some of each. Some more, some less. And we ask God to bless those efforts, his fountain to flow through us. My point, I think, is that the grace of God must be flowing like a fountain into our basin of our lives. And this life must be full. And we begin to gush over when we judge God as sufficient and not just adequate. And in this world today around us, I hope we don't spend too much time worrying about if we become too much like the world and spend more time in judging God's sufficient that he's endowed us with, as it says here in chapter 9 of Corinthians, where he says, I have what? God is, we judge God able to make all grace, all situations abound towards you. And that you always having all sufficiency. All. At all times. These are powerful words. They're too powerful for me. They're too powerful for you. All God's grace is his power. His might right hand. His way. His truth. His life. His savior. This is who we have. He is fully sufficient. We didn't get an adequate amount of Jesus Christ to cover our sins. We got the full sufficiency. Because that life is so full that it forgives all sin when God sees it. That's power. That's an ableness that we misjudge fully sufficient. I hope that we want to be under that fountain as much as possible. Paul talks here in chapter 9, verse 8. He does switch to a new argument. As he talks now in verse 6, 7, and 8. And he's no longer talking about physically sowing. He's talking about he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who judges God sufficient to meet all the needs around you, of you, your neighbors, your friends, your family. 
He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Judging God, able and true. Vincent's word study came up with a great summation, I think, of understanding the background of chapter 9, understanding the connection to Aristotle and Stoic thought, and understanding the twist that Paul was making. They make this comment, it says, Paul's acquaintance with the Stoicism and the influence of its vocabulary upon his own, it expressed, here he expresses the Stoic concept that a wise man as being sufficient in himself, wanting nothing and possessing yet everything, but here, not in the same sense of sufficiency of worldly goods, but of that moral quality bound up with self-consecration of faith, which renders the new self in Christ independent of external circumstances. Because, you see, Paul took them from the self-sufficiency of your own thoughts to what he says in verse 9, 8. He says, for God, this God is able to make all grace, all goodness, all charis, all gift abound towards you. That you always having all the sufficiency of a great caring God in all things may have an abundance that is overbrimming for every good work. And that's why Paul closes with verse 15, where he says, thanks be to God for this incredible gift, the sufficiency of